Good evening, poetry enthusiasts, and welcome to No Poetry, No Peace, a special online event brought to you by Mechanics Institute. My name is Nico Chen, and I am the Program Manager for Literature and Writing Programs here at Mechanics Institute. We are gathering virtually this evening to celebrate not only the transformative power of poetry, but also the community and shared humanity that poetry fosters. To our returning members, it's wonderful to see you again in this virtual space. And for those of you who are attending a Mechanics Institute event for the first time, a warm welcome to you as well. As we close out National Poetry Month, I'd like to reflect back on the programmatic offerings we had this month at Mechanics Institute. Earlier this month, we kicked off our National Poetry Month celebration with captivating in-person readings from three remarkable poet laureates, Lee Herrick, the California Poet Laureates, Tongo Eisen Martin, the San Francisco Poet Laureate, and Ayodele Nzinga, the Oakland Poet Laureate, who brought their unique voices and perspectives into our historic meeting room, filling them with words that challenge, comfort, and inspire. Earlier today for our Monday Noontime History series, we were privileged to delve into a poignant intersection of history and poetry through Jeffrey Thomas Leung's enlightening talk, Poems of Chinese Exclusion. His presentation illuminated the somber narratives of Angel Island, where Chinese immigrants were detained. Some of these detainees' hopes and despairs were etched into the wooden walls of the immigration station. These poems, carved during moments of uncertainty and longing, remind us of the enduring human spirits and the profound resilience that poetry can encapsulate. As we navigate the currents of our times, Poetry remains an essential vessel for expressing the complexities of human emotions and experiences. It is a force that can move those who listen towards greater understanding and compassion, breaking down barriers and building bridges across diverse communities. It is with great pride that we present this annual event today, this evening, No Poetry, No Peace, with one of our most steadfast members, Cheryl J. Bizet Boutet. To continue our efforts beyond National Poetry Month, Mechanics Institute is also proud to announce the formation of our very own member-led poetry writers group. We have just one spot left and we are limiting this intimate group to just eight people. This is a unique chance to be a part of a close-knit community of poets committed to meeting regularly and exploring the artistry of poetry in depth. Our inaugural meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, May 1st from 2 to 4 p.m. in our third floor library classrooms. Mark your calendars now and be part of the beginning of something truly special. And you can access this link in our chat box for more information about this Poetry Writers Group. I will now pass the mic over to our host of No Poetry, No Peace, the wonderful Cheryl J. Bazet Boutet. Cheryl, <laughs> please go ahead and take us away. All right. Thank you, Nico. And thank you, Mechanics Institute. And thank you, poets, and all of you out there who came to listen to the poets read tonight. Um, welcome to, well, the day before the end of 2024's National Poetry Month, and we're very happy that all of you have joined us. Uh, this evening we gather with poets from a variety of geographies, as well as a diversity of poetic inspirations. Together they bring a stunning mix of artistic expression through poetry that I am sure you will all enjoy. Welcome poets, welcome everyone. Let's do some poeting. Let's start with Eileen Casaneto, who is a Filipino American poet, a 2021 Academy of American Poets Fellow and the author of two poetry collections. Eileen also wrote the lyrics to Wide American Earth, which appeared at Carnegie Hall in 2023. Welcome, Eileen. Thank you, Cheryl. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. It is such an honor to be with all of you tonight. My poem was part of the Manifest Differently project. It interrogates the complicated legacies of manifest destiny in the Philippines, and also what it is to be both mother and country to a people in diaspora. Let me call you, sweetheart. Nobody asked what we wanted. We were entangled in the fate of empires as one falls and another rises. 
And we stood ravaged, squatted like our mothers over guava leaves and steaming water, moist heat soothing the perineal wound of childing. Fruit and spice mixed with blood now clotting, jelly-like and metallic. Sweetheart, say Sinta. The stress is on the second syllable, almost like a serenade or a slight movement, susurrus and so dear. Let me hear you whisper. Honey is thicker than blood, is thicker than water. What to make of the slaughter in a time of cholera just before the St. Louis World's Fair, where our kin were made to put on a show of butchering and eating dogs 20 or more each week in, in the name of empire, a baptism of fire. How do you like your dinuguan? soupy and smooth and savory. Our mother's mothers made it with offal, but the secret is in the pig's blood. Add a little vinegar before cooking. Add more when simmering, but never boiling. Keep the love light glowing. Keep the water bubbling, then let it rest. Add guava leaves and honey. I'm talking about tea, a remedy for cholera, malady of war, a mastery of paired movements like populations and their afflictions. How much of might is metal? What is the measure of an age? In Manila Bay, we buried one empire and birthed another. Before the century ended, we were a colony twice over, an archipelago of blood and ash. What is the color of empire as it sits on the Pacific with all the might of an age? Where lies its heart and undoing? First order of business was to quash the rebellion and impose English as the language of chance and circumstance, mind your diction and maledictions. The irony was that McKinley didn't even want us could not have told where our darned islands were within 2,000 miles, his words. But moral obligation is a force that bests the burdens of annexation, as does having a foothold in Asia. All told, Hem Ha, McKinley could not let go. When I next realized the Philippines had dropped into our laps, I confess I did not know what to do with them. We could not give them back to Spain. That would be cowardly and dishonorable. We could not turn them over to France and Germany. That would be bad business and discreditable. We could not leave them to themselves. They were unfit for self-government. But one day, I promise you, my people will board a ship, split the ocean, walk on water, scorch the earth, lose our continent, all to show how well we speak in English the kind no one wants to hear. We have lost more than what is bearable, devoted our days to finding a habitable language, to building a dwelling of sea water and ash. How much of it is ours, how much to keep, how much to let slip. Let me call you sweetheart. Let me find a way to start over, stay closer, one island to another. Here lies our heart and undoing. Say, Sinta, shelter and shudder some of our struggles. We are more than our history, our manifest destiny. We are a love story older than the sea. Sweetheart, ask me what I want as I tread wildly. Feel the belly of green turtles and gentle giants, citizens of the great Philippine Sea. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Does she have more time left, Nico? Uh, it's up to you if you want to do a two minute poem, Eileen. I think <laughs> I. Am I allowed to ask Eileen a question? We're not, we're not, uh, we're just doing reading. Thank you. Um, all right. Then our next poet is Lisa. Let me make sure I say this right. De Buono? Did I get it? Hey. Okay, you're on, you're on mute. Uh, Lisa is a Philadelphia poet who incorporates song, 
music, poetry, and dance into her art and has worked with teens in recovery, cancer patients, and is the founder of Ain't Pretty, a woman's writing collective. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much. It's just an honor to be here. The first poem that I'm gonna read um, is one actually that Nico had requested and um, it's called Inquiry. Start with your own question. It doesn't have to be profound. It just has to have a wondering so you have no idea where it might lead. Not only no idea, but no worry about how far away from your own clutching it might take you. A question that doesn't have one answer, but rather opens the possibility for even more. Not ones that have been living under that tired story buried on the back of your heart. Start with a question that doesn't make you feel like this is the only one you'll ever have, but rather one that can hold you like a hammock or a cradle or an old painted rowboat in which you just might let yourself drift far enough away from the shore of familiar. Nice. Thank you. Uh, the next two were written during the pandemic. Um, the second one is called Performance. And I really love music. And during the pandemic, I really missed live music. And so this poem addresses the return to that. Performance. After the post-pandemic concert, we drove home discussing which of the three silver-haired folk singers we liked best, whose guitar playing was more skilled, whose voice more clear, whether this was the last time we would hear them together. Pulling up the driveway, laughing from the high of live music, we untangled our tired bodies from the car, grasped our winter like a squeeze box and paused in the cold, breathless night. It was the darkest sky we could remember. The stars were a gleaming tremble, singing their own show tonight. Orion's Belt, Milky Way, Big Dipper, all together on Constellation stage. It almost seemed normal gazing up at them, as if the trio had been away for a long time and suddenly decided it was time to come home, holding everything up like they had never left. Thank you. And my last one uh, is called Skunk. One of my favorite poems is by Naomi Shihab Nye, Palestinian American poet who wrote this poem called uh, Valentine for Ernest Man, in which she mentions a man being delighted by the eyes of skunks. And so uh, this is my homage to the skunk that lived in our backyard. Petunia visits us, zigzagging across our common backyard. She is a waddling old lady, her snout digging for grubs like cane testing for solid ground. It's two in the afternoon and I marvel at her through my binoculars. Why are you here out in the bright sunlight of day? I think maybe she's pregnant, that her shuffling body is carrying her litter down low like a folded up apron filled with gathered fruit. When it's time for me to go food shopping, I see her in the patch of green near the driveway. Which of us will give up our ground first? I am ready to wave my white flag, but it is she who flattens herself 
into the tall grass. Is she dead or trying to make herself and her scent invisible? I can relate to playing possum in this fake it until you make it world now hidden behind the disguise of masks. But I shimmy past her to start my engine, turn the car around, and in the rear view mirror, I furtively see that she is back on her feet again, her nose held up to the sky, spring dousing her with all its perfumed air. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That was great. Our next up is Benjamin Gura Gira. Okay, wait a minute. I'm gonna I'm gonna get it. Kutsiarvi. Did I get it? Hey. Perfect. All right. Perfect. All right. So great to meet you, Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin is a native San Franciscan whose first book, West Portal, was a finalist for the Northern California Book Award. His poems appear in many publications, and in addition to writing, he works with youth in Oakland through Soccer Without Borders. Welcome, Benjamin. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and thank you, Nico, for all the work to organize. Um, it's great to be here with you all. And I just want to start acknowledging I'm feeling very inspired by all the student activism that's happening right now, and um, it's nice to, to be reading in, in the context of that time. Um, I'm going to read three three poems. Uh, this first poem I want to read is called Catania, and uh, that is the second largest town in Sicily, uh, which is where my family comes from. So um, this is Catania. We lived in a stone farmhouse at the edge of town. I'd been assigned to process asylum claims, and you'd come to write about the abandoned homes in the island's interior the government was selling cheap. A family of barn swallows lived inside our chimney. In the mornings, I drove to the intake center through fields of hay, alfalfa. A crop of sunflowers spanned the tract along the creek. Most of the men I interviewed were farmers back home, They'd left because of drought, sometimes blood or blight. Afternoons, the sunflowers bowed in their furrows and the clouds turned alabaster. At home, I'd find you lying on the hearth, listening to the swallows. We were good to each other, though new in our love, with shape to our days. The fighting spread and more ships came ashore. Women and children were held in a new location. Impractically, I studied Sicilian, not because my grandfather spoke it, because I wanted to unlearn time. I could have looked up the word for sunflower. I could have asked, but it was the not knowing I savored on the slow drives through the fields the pheasants disappearing into thick brush along the road. The possibility of a word that could redeem us. I lay beside you on the cool stone beside the chimney. The swallows were out hunting or looking for hair, grass. Most of the rich who'd bought the empty houses couldn't fix them up, you told me. Supplies were scarce, labor hard to find. Night wind carried the smell of the fields through the screenless windows. A flock of egrets followed the baler, gorging on the insects and frogs, the blades exposed and left without shelter. Um, and I'll just read uh, two more poems. This next one is also one that uh, Nico requested. And Nico was also a teacher at Oakland International High School, uh, where I've done some work for, for a long time. And this poem comes from some work there. Uh, so thank you, Nico, for your teaching and your, your, your mentorship of youth. And this poem is about holding space for young people. The rungs. Only the person with the green dice should be talking, I remind the boys, holding up the oversized foam cubes. And the others should be listening, Kay says, 
And how should we listen? Con el corazón, M replies, thumping his chest with his closed fist. That's right, I say, with the heart. Who wants to start? The dice are passed around the circle and the boys gloss over the checking question. When they reach B, who'd walked here unaccompanied from Honduras three months ago, he holds them like boulders. We straighten when his lip begins to quiver. It's not my place to tell you what he shared that day. But I can tell you how M put his hand on B's back and said, Mahe, desahogarte, which translates roughly to undrown yourself, though no English phrase so willingly accepts that everyone has drowned and that we can reverse that gasping, expel the fluids from our lungs. I sit quietly as the boys make with their bodies the rungs of a ladder and B climbs up from the current, sits in the sun for a few good minutes before he jumps back in. The dice finish the round and we are well over time. I resist the urge to speak about rafts, what it means to float. Good, I tell them. Let's go back to class. After handshakes and side hugs, I'm left alone in the small room with a box of unopened tissues, two Starburst wrappers on the ground. Um, and I'll finish just with this very short little poem called The Nest. Uh, the Nest. And this is dedicated to a Salvadoran poet, Alfredo Espino, who wrote a poem uh, also called The Nest many years ago. This morning, I watched a goldfinch disappear into a tree through a hole no bigger than my open mouth. From the hollow, the finch began her crooning. That's what poetry is, I thought, not the tree, but the hidden song. Not the yellow bird, but the instinct to climb inside the darkness to sing. Thank you all. Thank you, Benjamin. Our next poet is my friend, Lucille Langday. We've done a lot of things together. Uh, Lucille is the author of four poetry chapbooks and seven full length poetry collections. Among her many awards and honors are two Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Literary Awards and the Joseph Henry Jackson Award. She is also a publisher at Scarlet Tanager Books. Welcome, Lucille. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, I'm honored and delighted to be here. I'm going to read three poems. Uh, the first one is called The Legacy, and it's dedicated to my grandchildren. I leave you the last 4% of the ancient redwoods that once covered more than 2 million acres of the California coast. Watch for Roosevelt elks, black-tailed deer and mountain lions among the trees, for spotted owls, marbled merlets, flycatchers, thrushes, jays, and woodpeckers in the canopy. I leave you the last 10,000 blue whales of the hundreds of thousands that once roamed the oceans, the largest animals known to have lived. They've been recorded singing Beethoven's Ode to Joy. Their huge hearts beat only twice per minute when they dive beneath the surface of the sea. I leave you a watery planet now warming because humans are so dependent on oil and coal. Wildfires turn the sky orange and drive away birds, while flash floods shatter houses and trees in their path. May your generation create a world that runs on goodwill, fairness, sunshine, and wind. I leave you a country torn by hatred and lies. Though these are age-old problems, they must be faced and conquered again by each new generation. Don't believe everything you hear. People lie for many reasons, ignorance, malice, mischief, greed. Truth always exists somewhere 
and you can find it. I leave you the redwood in my backyard, which suffers from Botryosphaeria cankers, and the Anna's hummingbirds that visit the Mexican sage out front while I write poems inside. I leave you those two brief records of my journeys, joys, and sorrows. I leave you grief. I leave you love. I leave you hope. Mm. And the next poem um, is another one that Nico requested. Uh, it's a short poem called Among Humpback Whales, Where Does a Protest Song Lead? It will pass unnoticed under the waves in the great heave and suck of the sea, and the whales will go on singing for months on end, weaving low resonant notes for mating or pleasure until they reach Baja, where in backyards and dumps, turtle shells pile up, swearing at you and me. And my last poem is called Letter to Send in a Space Capsule. And this is addressed to um, intelligent beings uh, elsewhere in the universe, millions of light years in the future. <laughs> I lived on the third planet circling an ordinary star at the edge of a spiral galaxy, two million light years from the Andromeda Nebula. We called it Earth. In spring, the mock cherry trees were flocked with white blossoms when maples blazed green and hummingbirds with long, narrow beaks and brilliant throats sucked nectar from, from red and orange flowers. In summer, the sky was pale blue and sometimes feathered with clouds like the wings of giant swans. When our star known as the sun was at its peak, the pavement of our streets began to sizzle, forming black tar beads and ice cream, sweet and sticky, dripped from children's cones. As the earth tipped away from the sun, maple trees turned red, liquid ambers gold, and falling leaves swirled in every gust of wind. When no leaves clung to the trees, the year's final season arrived like a bride adorning the world with ice and white lace. The planet was mostly covered with oceans that filled great basins surrounding continents and islands that rose green and lush from the radiant water that surged and frothed at every shore. I was born 20 centuries after the birth of a prophet many considered the son of the creator of the earth, the heavens and everything living. My species, Homo sapiens, was one of many warm blooded creatures with four limbs, a backbone and enamel teeth. Our brains were large and we figured out how to shatter atoms and even fuse nuclei, releasing energy like the heart of a star. We built enough nuclear bombs to incinerate or irradiate all life and fill the atmosphere with ash. Needless to say, most people didn't want to use them, but we spoke many languages and lived by different customs and nations that couldn't reach agreement often waged war. As we burned fossil fuels to run our factories and cut down forests to build our towering cities, the earth grew warmer, the air turned grayer, and the polar ice caps crumbled into the sea. One by one, flowers, frogs, worms, and birds began to disappear. It may sound strange, but most people care deeply for the planet and each other. This is what I know. The language in which I write is English, a strongly stressed Indo-European tongue with regional variation and peculiar spelling. I hope the clapper rail with its brown and white striped belly still inhabits the salt marsh and the scarlet bugler still blooms each spring in the coastal hills of California, my home. 
I hope the rain still falls on fields and rivers. I hope you can decipher this code. Thank you. Ah, nice. Thank you. Our next poet is another of my friend, poet friends, Osiris. Osiris, uh, can you sit back a little bit? Oh, how's yeah, that? Oh. Move back, move back a little bit. How's that? A little bit more. Well, that's slightly better, but what we see is the bottom half of your face. Oh, wait, can you, do you need to just see my face? It would be nice. Oh, <laughs> how's that? You're, you're, you're too close. Well, we're, that's better. Okay. Okay. Right. It looks different on my screen than it does on you all. For me, it's showing me kind of far away. So I apologize about that. That's okay. Osiris is an award-winning author and independent publisher of poetry and children's books through Osiris Inc. with the goal of utilizing his platforms to tell stories that will positively impact people's lives. In 2023, he launched his Osiris Inc. podcast. He is also actively serving in the military. And as you heard, if you were on earlier, has a set of twins. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Who are right? All oh, right. yes. <laughs> Welcome, Osiris. Thank you so much, Ms. Cheryl. Always a pleasure. Thank you all for having me. So I want to read four poems, but one is 14 words. So I'll start with that one. All right. This one's titled Defeated or Not. Defeated. Depleted. Received it. Relieved it. Delivered. Dismembered. Live. Forgive. Deserving. Preserving. Lead. Bleed. Best. Blessed. That's all I got for that one. It's from, from my dear sick men of ours. So they, these, these next three are going to be really, really deep. <laughs> really deep. So I don't know if you if anyone's familiar with the story of Gabriel. Um, I think his name is Gabriel Palmdale. Is where he lived at. It was like a seven or eight-year-old kid. It's a pretty, pretty devastating story. But my wife went to school with a relative of hers. Anyway, um, this hit me particularly hard because he was born on the same day as me. So this title, this poet poem is titled February 20th. 2005 through May 24th, 2013. Such violence in his home. Is this what true love looks like? Physically attacking her son, ashamed of what he looks like. Her boyfriend caged him in a bathroom cabinet, stored away with cleaning supplies. Neither could care less for his well being and slowly counting down until he dies. Nowhere to run, nowhere to turn. Just a scared eight-year-old boy being left to burn, tortured for years, and his social workers did nothing. Suppose his cracked skull and broken ribs were just a sign of him bluffing. Named after an angel, murdered by a devil, burned with flames, beaten by metal. In such pain, he writes, I love you so much that I will kill myself. Even in his final moments of life, he still chose to love his mother and no one else. Well, not all pearls are worth a fortune. This pearl only brought misfortune. He was just a boy, fatally beaten because he failed to pick up his toys. You stood six feet, two inches, 270 pounds. This child barely weighed 60 pounds. An ex-security guard who apparently was a nice guy. Not everything is as it appears to the naked eye. You two left him naked, why? Dial 911 because he wouldn't open his eyes. First responders arrived. He isn't breathing, they said. What hope did he have to survive? Several injuries to his body as he lied on the ground, screaming for his life, crying without a sound. Cremation came the only flame that could ensure his protection. His ashes remain with his grandparents, who will ensure his protection. You can finally receive the love that you need. Rest in paradise. Now you are finally freed. Uh, uh, how much time do I have left, by the way? Want to make sure. On my clock, you have four minutes and 30 seconds. OK, cool. I was hoping so. OK, this next one is about my son, who also shares the name Noah. 
Hi, Noah. I know you're in here. Hello, son. Nice to see you. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. This one is called My Soul Survivor. This happened. This is based off of his first night back coming home for the first time. <clears throat> Those fishbowl eyes gazing back at me could bring a tear down my face with the innocence you express. After weeks of separation, our family can finally be together and head home to rest. What a day that was, but the night would come as a surprise. We're all lying down to sleep for the night, but someone almost dies. My sweet baby boy is choking and his face is turning purple. My wife is trying to save his life as she's pacing in a circle. This can't be happening to us. We were all just in our car. The paramedics are on their way as I perform CPR. His body is limp, but his six day old fists are clenched. He's fighting for his life, but won't move an inch. My baby isn't breathing. He's on the verge of losing his life. What's scarier is that this mostly occurred in the arms of my wife. Death knocking at the door, dressed as firefighters. He's breathing, they said. Your son is a survivor. Ambulance arrive, and one parent has required to go. Both my wife and I are so traumatized, but I decided to go. Staring at you on a gurney for 34 minutes was an endless sight of fear. I just want to hear your cries in my ear. Thankfully, there is a happy ending to this traumatizing day. He survived and is still alive to this day. Thank you, Lord, for granting my baby boy with another day of life. So, all right, I got one more. One more. This one is from a poetry, um, a poem that I wrote that's going to be in my next poetry book. The title is Undisclosed. I'm going to play a little song with it. It's uh, Moonlight Sonata. This poem is called Ocean of Emotions. <clears throat> Why do I refute the notion of my mind being buried in the ocean? Emotions motion is slow motion until I arise from the ocean. So overwhelmed as if I'm drowning in this ocean. Regardless of my efforts, this never ending cycle is in motion. But I fear this ocean, I swim in a panic and do my best to escape the fate of the Titanic. But my panic has left me stranded on a door sinking towards the ocean floor on the bottom of the Atlantic. Countdown's begun. I'm struggling to hold my breath until it counts down to one. My wife, my sons, I'm shook, scared. My life is done. Suddenly, a hand grabs onto my wrist, pulling me towards the sun, free from my struggles, no longer feeling numb. Off in the distance are one-winged angels surrounded by nuns. At least, that's what it seemed like before I was awakened from this dream that seemed right. Thank you all very much. Very, Thank very much. You. Thank you, Osiris. Of course, it's a pleasure. Next, we have Noah Warren. Uh, Noah, I found you on KALW, Bay Poets. Uh, we have that in common. Um, Noah lives in Los Angeles and is the author of Complete Stories and winner of the Yale series of Younger Poets. He is a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley and teaches at Claremont McKenna College. Welcome, Noah. Thank you, thank you, Cheryl. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's just, it's a really beautiful to hold community with you. Um, I'm gonna read just a few poems. Um, one per request, uh, this, Nico requested this poem called Pocket. Love of the world is so clearly come and go. The way we talk sounds beautiful and sad. You have to say these three words before you can try the harder thing. The air at evening crumbles into rose flakes. The wind like a child's breath. This is cement. It's almost hard now, but when it's new, it's soft. If we step in it then, it'll be there forever. To describe is to praise. I've always felt that. Two crows fly up and disappear into the depths of the redwood. Talking with Sarah in bed, I touch her neck. How often do we use the word safe each day? Thanks. A walk sounds nice. 
When I write this winter, I trace lines of motion. I conclude I've lived. My friend's voice tells me I am more than a series of inclinations. Twilight knotted with dislikes. This next poem is also called Talk. Um, I was, during the pandemic, listening, well, you know, there were all these times where you couldn't actually hang out with people. Um, and so you had to kind of summon them up um, and stage your little conversations. Um, and also maybe, you know, your modes of thinking were a little dissociative, a little loopy. Um, so I started putting white space between thoughts. This poem is also called Talk. She painted me a quartered window, dominated by the airy whites and browns of the top right quarter into which I felt myself receding. The road was drying unevenly and the clouds stood above it as you would stand above a thread. Where has my mother gone? There was a moment yesterday evening when my mind leapt wholly with desire. Then for an hour this morning I cried and now there is now the icy lake the houses the people changing slowly into other people yes i love reading and exercising and love seasons moving the past and the present loom like equal calamities above the hill i'll climb in my too warm clothes my face gradually reddening to show that I'm still as brave as I was when I was a child. And the room went still with words I understood but didn't understand and felt it was somehow my role to heal. There was a brother who melted from my arms back into the walls of the womb. The people who have them relax on their balconies with drinks. Um, and I guess I'll read just one more. Um, and this is a poem called University. I also, like Ben, have been so inspired by seeing all the student activism we've been seeing, and it really inspiring. University. Buildings from the international movement articulate a question in statement form. The ways in which we wait, you wait. I keep turning the handle of this life. I open the oxblood cover and fall deeply into slumber. Speaking naked at the lectern, I split open a hyacinth. In a sadder one, I have to stand very still. I am for the weather, a tower of bells. Who were those children I used to play with that bullied me? Windy evenings under the plum trees, raining plums. They held me down. They needed to hear their own names. Enter. Enter. What a murder of crows has descended on the bristles of the synthetic field. The blankets and pizza boxes, like so much black dust. I remember standing in front of an automatic amber-tinted door before the bank opened. Hello, Teller. I want to save the rain that lingers in my wife's hair long after we walk. The cherries and black garlic softening on the windowsill. The smell of open soil. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Thank all of you poets. Before I read mine, I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate all of you being here and how wonderful you have all been this evening. Nico? Of course, um, I will read the bio of our wonderful hostess with the mostest, Cheryl J. Bazet Boutte. <laughs> Cheryl J. Bazet Boutte is an award winning, internationally published indie author and poet. In addition to being a short story writer, she is also a highly praised novelist. This event is named for No Poetry, No Peace, the book of poetry that she co-wrote with her daughter, Angela. And Cheryl, please take us away with your beautiful poetry. All right. 
I want uh, to ask all of you, when I say no poetry, no peace, I want you to repeat it after me. Uh, because the poem I'm going to read is called No Poetry, No Beats. <laughs> it can saunter in serenely, press its form against any door of any room, enter on a vapor trace, hijacking my senses, taking over my everything. Yet much of the time, it knocks hard on my wall, a sleep interrupted, slapping my rim, into wide-eyed recognition that another one has arrived, compelling me to rise, to speak it before it is gone, write it before it is erased. But I turn my pillow to the cool side and sneak slumbers return, leaving open the door to a morning of regret, a day of clumsy attempts to reach back and get the right words in the right order in the right rhythm. So many times I foolishly let it sleep away, dreaming myself good enough to retrieve it all intact. In my chaotic wakefulness with original meaning, thinking I would repossess it easily with my anointed poetic compass. Even as it warned in whisper, there will be war within and conflict unresolved, I will scatter you if you do not find me. No poetry, no peace. No poetry, no peace. I awake and still believe the prose of the dream is tucked away and easy to wave return by the magic wand of the bard. But that is the lie of the fantasy. As sunrise scorches recall, I mourn another disappearance to the toss and the turn, to the burning wet skin, to this false strength of memory, this confidence of divine recollection, this fear that if I rise, I will have to explain why I am up at this hour and will have to reveal a poem is here. I must let it in. No poetry, no peace. No poetry, no, poetry, no, no peace. peace. It doesn't give up on me. An unrelenting surprise. I do believe it loves me. Another has arrived, compelling me to rise, to speak it before it's gone, to write it before it is erased. No poetry, no peace. No, no poetry, poetry, no, no peace. peace. Now I am loud with it. I know the consequences of an abuse of this power. It will all be said, whether you ever hear it or not. I am a soldier in this war of self-appointed prose protector from those who live without the reason and the rhyme and can be prone to evil. No poetry, no peace. No, no poetry, no peace. I did not know it would make me feel this way. So I do not hesitate on those nights more frequent now. I am duty bound to trap it and assure its capture. So I can set it free. I write in the dark on paper. I can only feel with my hands purposely spacing the lines much too far apart so that there are no misunderstandings. While the armor of urgency shields each movement and the words fall out with the hope that clarity is still present in the next. And somehow I know all will be well. I have kept the night safe. There will be another morning. I have once again completed my ordered contribution against the tide of damage caused by the missing poem in the No Verse Badlands, where punishment is swift when words are not used as intended, leaving space for alternatives that lack compassion and grace and diminish the one who ignores the message of the muse. No poetry, no peace. No, no poetry, poetry, no, no, no peace. peace. Thank you. Thank you all again for being with us this evening. I see we have uh, a few more minutes. 
Um, Noah, you said that you had some questions you might want to ask, or a, a question at least. But I want to thank each and every one of you poets for being here. And thank you, audience, for being here. And I hope you enjoyed what you heard this evening. No poetry, no peace. No poetry, no peace. Okay. Um, I would like to follow up with one question for all of our poets. And that question for you all is, tell us the story of one of the poems that you read today. How did this poem emerge? And how did it find itself configured either on the page or through your voice? And I'm gonna pass the mic over to Eileen to share her story of her poem. Eileen, would you like to get us started? Um, I think I talked about it a little bit. It's 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 about um, the U.S. Uh, colonization of the Philippines. Um, uh, the Philippines. We were the the um, the U.S.'s first colony in 1898, and um, this is the 125th anniversary. So this is uh, um, interrogating the the history and legacies of of that complicated history. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit more about how this sort of poem emerged in your consciousness? Like what was going on in your own sphere while this poem was making itself present to you? Uh, I had to do a bit of research. I found, uh, um, I went back to um, Library of Congress records about what uh, um, then President McKinley said. And I also interspersed it with um, family histories. Um, and, and, I think that's that's basically um, how it it came about. It it took a while to put together, just because um, I'm I'm at a point where I, I think I'm I'm moving towards a, a certain direction in my writing, but then I became I was invited to be part of manifest differently, and so I had to go back to to a, a part of my history that I had not thought about for a while. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, next up, we're, I'm going to ask um, Lisa De Buono the same question. Lisa, how did um, a poem that you read today emerge and reconfigure itself on the page? Sure. I'm going to talk about skunk. And I said a little bit about it before that I was inspired by Ern uh, Valentine for Ernest Mann, a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye. And this poem was written during the pandemic. And so you know, I was outside a lot and and we had a lot of animals visiting throughout the neighborhood. And I was just really struck by um, this idea of skunk and how sometimes, you know, the first thing we do is we smell the scent of the skunk and sometimes we turn our noses up at that. And so what I really wanted to do was just spend some time observing the skunk that was moving through our neighborhood. and And then I just started to imagine you know, how are we going to negotiate our living together in this space, you know, which is kind of a metaphor for what we might have all been doing during the pandemic, sort of how do we now imagine this new space that we're in. So that's how the poem, the poem emerged. Thank you for sharing. Um, that's a beautiful story, Lisa. And next up we have Ben. Ben, would you like to share with us about your poem and how it emerged and became a poem? Yeah, yeah, I think I there's something I've been thinking about a lot, um, and it's, it's it's from some uh, some criticism I was reading recently, um, but, I, but it's just this sentence it said about Wordsworth's poetry. He takes a subject or a story merely as pegs or loops to hang thought and feeling on, um, and mm -hmm. I thought that was a really interesting idea. Mm -hmm. So, just yet. Yeah, the story merely as pegs or loops to hang thought and feeling on. And so I guess the poems I read, the first two are definitely very narrative and, um, but not necessarily, you know, exactly true to how the story went, but more so as pegs or loops to hang thought and feeling on. So I think that that's kind of what I, I've been thinking about with experience and how, how do, how can you, how can I allow my own experiences and moving through the world, um, as subject or story to hang thought and feeling on. And I think that's where poems can come from. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, Ben. Lucille, you're up next. How did your poem emerge and 
find itself through your voice or on the paper? Okay, well, I'll say a bit about the, the first poem I read, The, the Legacy, um, and that's the most recent of the poems I, I read. I wrote it last year, and I found myself worrying about the state of the world that um, we're leaving to the next generation. And I have uh, four grandchildren who currently range in age from 13 to 21. And I, I want them to be able to have good lives and, the, and to be able to enjoy the beauty of the earth. And I started thinking about the, you know, the loss of species and climate change and war and all the horrible lies and hatred that are found on social media. And so I tried to I write a poem um, addressing them and um, not uh, avoiding these problems in any way, but as much as possible to turn it in to something pos positive because there's a lot of beauty um, that's still here. We still have a beautiful planet and uh, there's, there's still a lot of opportunity to turn this around and find solutions. So rather than saying, I'm sorry, this is such a mess, it's all hopeless. I I wanted to say that then, you know, that um, all of us, including you, can do something about that. So that's where I was coming from. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lucille. Next up, we have Osiris. Osiris, do you want to share about how your poem emerged and became something on the page or in your voice? Of course, yes. Thank you so much. I'm going to speak specifically about my sole survivor, about my, my, my about my son Noah. So, they, it was just a real tough night, and it actually took a long time to even have my wife read it. She would not look at, inside of that poetry book. She wouldn't read it, and I actually told her like, "That's the one you don't want to pay attention to because it's pretty, it's pretty detailed in the descriptions that I give about it." But it was just tough. It was really tough and the most therapeutic way that I can uh, uh, believe to approach it was just writing it down um, poetically. But, you know, it's, it's interesting how life and how particular moments in life can trend, uh, can be transformative. Because of that, I ended up being relatively like connected to my, to my children, even up to this day. And I ended up just starting reading uh, reading a lot of children's books to them, and then I eventually started writing my own children's books. Um, so I want to give them away. Like if anybody has children or anyone who is interested in children's stories, I have this right here, and I'd be I'd love to just mail them out or send them to them. Um, it's 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 all love, it's all joy, and it brought me a lot of joy to be able to read to my children. That came out of a dark moment. So, um, yeah, that's that that's my that's my answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing that, Osiris. Next up, we have Noah Warren. How did your poem emerge and reconfigure itself on the page or through your voice? I think the pieces I read were kind of, they were light in a certain way. There's a kind of um, a pedestrian rhythm. I wanted to kind of to create space, I said, between the, between the thoughts. Um, and so I guess they're kind of prayers. Um, they're prayers for a lightness when, uh, you know, one gets melancholic um, and one needs to kind of remind oneself that it's all, it's not all bowling balls all the way down. Um, and so finding that rhythm was a way of kind of uh, finding a sound I could think to. And it was a way of, uh, you know, in these, kind of like couplety, these couplety little near nonsense phrases, a way of kind of fitting other people's speech to the world um, and trying to convince myself to see the world in terms of that lightness, even as it's threaded with a little dark. Thank you for sharing that, Noah. And last but obviously not least, Cheryl, would you like to share your answer to the question and close this out for today? Well, um, my entire thought about no poetry, no peace uh, and the poem that I read this evening is is to share the message that as poets, and I don't know if the rest of you feel this way, but for me, I don't own the poetry, the poetry owns me. And when it arrives, it arrives. And it does not call first, it does not make an appointment. 
and uh, there is a compulsion to make sure that it is captured. And that's what I um, tried to capture in that poem uh, as the namesake of, of the book. I also um, believe that writing in general for writers, uh, it becomes an obligation, but it is a joyful obligation to make sure that you are sending your messages out into the world, because this is how we create empathy and understanding, and hopefully at some point, peace. And I thank you all for joining us and helping that to happen. Thank you all so much for being here today for this wonderful gathering. I invite everyone in our audience to also, if you can, open up your video and wave to the wonderful group that is in front of you. Send the, send the love forward into the world and let those um, you know ripples move outwards into the world as we um, finish up our um, National Poetry Day programming here at Mechanics Institute. 